Well, welcome today to the uh, CBEAR virtual seminar series. Uh, my name is Kent Messer, and I'm very happy that uh, you're joining us today to hear uh, Dr. Palm Forrester talk about lessons and recommendations for conducting research to inform agri-environmental initiatives. Uh, before we begin, let me just make a couple quick announcements and remind people about what CBEAR is. Um, as we can see in the next slide here, that you know, we continue to uh, be very engaged in uh, bringing insights from behavioral science to agro-environmental agro programs. We uh, love to use experiments. We love to uh, learn about how we can test uh, these approaches to help inform evidence-based policy and practices whenever possible. Um, we're you know, very happy to be working uh, throughout the country and, and the world on these topics and appreciate all uh, people do to um, you know, stay connected to this network and be a part of the learning process that we're uh, um, engaged in. I want to show a next slide uh, that talks about an exciting uh, opportunity for people who are really interested uh, in these topics, and that is uh, we have a new uh, special issue coming out of food policy. So we're going to be accepting papers. They'll be due on August 31st, and um, you can go on to the food policy website to see this call for papers. Hope you'll also be seeing it in the next couple of days as we push this out. So again, we're going to be looking at issues around applying behavioral science to agricultural food and agro-environmental policy. Uh, we specifically are looking for things that do link into agro-environmental policy. That's going to be uh, very valuable. And um, we're really happy to be uh, guest editing this, uh, not, not only with Paul and I, but Pallavi as well, uh, bringing this uh, special issue uh, forward. So uh, thanks for uh, many of you who contributed to uh, this idea. It is an open call. We'll go through a full review process and again, the deadline is August 31st. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we're always excited about the attendance that these uh, seminar series has. And uh, we'll pass it back over to Dr. Laura Paul to talk about the uh, rules about this um, procedure and where we're going. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kent. And welcome, everyone. We're glad to have you here. So just some quick reminders. So today, uh, we will, again, use the chat feature for any questions that you might have. Uh, so, so at any point, you can you can put a question in the chat, and I will be uh, take, putting them all together for uh, the end of the end of the seminar. Um, everyone will remain muted, and then a quick uh, plug for our next seminar is on March seventh, uh, with and that is a co-hosted seminar with our uh, colleagues at Recap. So. Today, I'm really happy to introduce our seminar speaker, uh, Dr. Leah Palm Forster. Uh, Dr. Palm Forster is an agricultural and environmental economist. She is an associate professor in the Department of Applied Economics and Statistics and associate uh, director of the Center for Experimental and Applied Economics, both at the University of Delaware. Uh, Dr. Palm Forster's research examines farmer decision making and the design of agro-environmental programs and policies to enhance ecosystem service provision and agricultural landscapes. Uh, Dr. Palm Forster has a number of uh, 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 good uh, positions, including as a fellow with the Center for Behavioral and Experimental Agroenvironmental Research, that's us, and is a member of the Chesapeake Bay Program's uh, Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, Dr. Palm Forster currently serves as associate editor for the AJE and is co-chair of the Northeast Agriculture and Resource Economics Association's Career Advancement and Mentorship Program, which I highly recommend. So uh, I'm really excited today for Dr. Palm Forster to talk about her contributions to the Handbook of Agricultural Economics. Uh, and yeah, looking forward to it. So thanks so much, Leah. Thanks. All right, thank you, Laura. Um, really appreciate the very kind introduction. I'm just going to switch over to my screen now. You all should be able to see my PowerPoint in presentation mode. Can you Let's see go. that? All right, wonderful. Got all these screens going on, so I'm never quite sure if it's going to go the right way, but um, it's a real honor uh, to be here this morning. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to speak and I wanna give a big thanks to the CBEAR leadership team uh, and especially to, to Laura for all of her efforts in organizing such a great seminar series. So, so thanks a lot. Um, this, I'm gonna be speaking about um, a book chapter that I was 
recently published. Um, this is a chapter co-authored with Kent Messer in the Handbook of Agricultural Economics. Um, and in this chapter, we provide an overview of the, um, the value of using experimental and behavioral economics tools um, to examine agricultural decision-making and help inform uh, programs and policies. So if you uh, want a 40, 45 minute version of an 80 you know, plus page chapter, you came to the right place. Um, there's, there's a lot going on in this chapter and I'm gonna do my best to, to synthesize it um, uh, clearly in, in you know, the next 40 minutes or so. I'm starting with key takeaways and I'm gonna end with key takeaways, but these are the, the five kind of points I really hope that you walk away um, from this seminar with today. Uh, the first being that there's a lot of val valuable insights that we can gain from behavioral and experimental economics research in this area. Um, you know, the, the reference list in this book chapter is quite extensive. So I'll direct you to, to really the excellent papers that have been published by many people on this, uh, you know, on, here today, right, on the Zoom uh, seminar. So this is a great body of work and, um, you know, we did our best to try to highlight all, all of the value um, that researchers are bringing forth. Of course, as researchers, we face trade-offs um, when we're designing experiments. So in the chapter, we talk a lot about complementarities around different types of experiments. And we say these are, we can think of these as stages. And so I'll, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Of course, evidence-based policymaking is only as good as the evidence. Um, and there's some challenges that we face as researchers to make sure that we are generating research um, that's rigorous, credible, uh, and robust. And so we'll talk about those challenges and best practices that have been put forth um, to, to deal with those. One of my favorite parts of the chapter is about research ethics and engaging agricultural communities. So I'm gonna speak about that. And this is an area I actually hope to work on more um, moving forward. Uh, and then I'll end with um, a framework that we put forth to help researchers uh, assess opportunities and, and risks of different types of studies um, that they could um, engage with. All right, so starting off with thinking about these insights, um, I probably don't have to do much convincing uh, for, for this group that, that there's a lot of value uh, in, in insights that have been generated uh, from these literatures. Uh, Behavioral and experimental economics has contributed to a richer understanding of human decision making in general, uh, and this has been widely recognized. You know, we have several Nobel laureates that have been at the forefront of these fields and have been recognized for those important contributions. And we have examples uh, of, of insights that have been applied to a number of different contexts outside of the agro environmental context. Um, you know, a, a kind of famous and, uh, example that most of us are familiar with are the open power studies of energy conservation and the role of um, social comparisons and en energy use. Of course, there are many other examples in fields like education and finance and health. Um, and, and so we've, there's, there's evidence that using these insights can improve the outcomes of programs and policies. And we have different teams that have been embedded in governments um, and working with, with NGOs to really integrate these insights. Now, compared to other fields though, the amount of this work in the agro-environmental domain is, is more um, limited, right? So there's certainly a lot of fantastic research happening here, but I'll argue that there's a, a just, a, great amount of opportunity, I guess I'll say, to really tap in uh, and learn more about how we can um, inform policies and programs. And of course, this is really important because we are then influencing the management of the human engineered landscape, which is agriculture, um, you know, not in a natural landscape. So our decisions as the engineers of, of this um, ecosystem are really important. And we are, would be impacting over half of the world's habitable land area. So there's significant spending so that these, these lands are managed um, in ways that provide more environmental benefits. And so then the question becomes, how can we make the spending, um, you know, how can we make the programs more cost effective? So for the limited budgets, we're getting more environmental benefit. 
just um, from a U.S. perspective, the USDA conservation programs, um, the investment in those is over $6 billion a year. So we're talking about uh, significant amounts of money. And some of you may be wondering, well, why can't we just apply what we've learned from these other fields that you just mentioned, and then just do that in our agro-environmental programs? And what we argue is these are unique settings, right, where the decisions are generating um, these impure public goods, which involves joint production of both private uh, goods and public benefits um, that can be generated through the ways that agricultural land is managed. Uh, and so it's not clear that we can always take a finding from a consumer study and just apply it to producers. Um, you know, finally, in this kind of motivation here, um, experimental approaches have a lot of appeal, right, particularly from a policymaker perspective, because you're able to show this kind of causal relationship between an intervention and outcome, um, which is very compelling, right, to show and demonstrate this effect. Um, it also aligns with initiatives that are happening um, in many different areas of the world. In the US, we have the Evidence Act of 2018. Um, there's also similar um, focus on evidence-based policy in the EU's common agricultural policy. And so, you know, in general, there is recognition of the value of experiments. And so we are trying with this chapter to provide tools um, you know, and examples that allow researchers to jump into this space and, and make these contributions uh, and engage with uh, uh, program administrators and policymakers. Uh, so I, like I mentioned, there has been a lot of great work, right? And we over, provide an overview of a lot of this work in the chapter. Um, this is a figure from a paper that I really like in a special issue of the European Review of Agricultural Economics in 2019. Um, this paper by Desart et al. Um, does a really nice job of categorizing different behavioral factors um, and talking about the implications for agro-environmental program and policy design. And so they provide these three broad categories of different factors and cognitive factors, social factors, and dispositional factors. And I think it's a fantastic framework to then dig in and figure out, well, where are the kind of things that we've, we've researched a lot or where are existing questions? What insights can we go ahead and directly start, um, you know, kind of trying out, right? And, in programs that haven't been tried before, um, you know, in a systematic way in which we're having controls and treatments and measuring the, the, um, the responses, right, to these interventions. And then what spots do we need a lot more foundational research and, and knowledge before we will go out and try it? Um, so I think this is a great paper that I'll, you know, um, probably mention a few other times uh, throughout the presentation. Um, just so for one example, you know, they, they highlight risk, which uh, has been a focus of a lot of other studies in this area, uh, but thinking about what we know about farmers, about being um, generally risk averse, uh, overweighting, small probabilities of, um, you know, negative outcomes, like different downside risk um, challenges, and thinking what does that mean for programs, right? Well, it then you know, is likely the case that programs that help, you know, reduce these perceived risks, uh, provide opportunities for farmers to try different practices um, and kind of get at their foot in the door could be very valuable. So thinking about how we integrate um, more of those insights into the design of, of programs is important. Okay. Um, another um, kind of uh, important development uh, has been the acknowledgement of the of nudges, right, and how those can influence behavior. Um, general idea here being that people respond uh, to their decision-making environments in, in often predictable ways, and so by altering those environments and providing the right, um, you know, framework for those decisions to be made can help us improve the outcomes uh, and generate, you know, in this case, more environmental benefits. Uh, so examples of this have been that there's been research done that changing the default bid level in a reverse auction um, could reduce the cost share amount that farmers are requesting, right? So that's an example. Uh, in a 
2019 paper that I worked on with several colleagues, we took this framework um, called the MindSpace framework developed by Dolan and, and his colleagues, and we uh, discussed how it applies to the agri-environmental context. Um, the MindSpace framework uh, include, talks about insights about messengers, incentives, norms, default, defaults, salience, priming, effect, commitment, and ego. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into each one of these, but I'll just say as an example, we have programs that attempt to tap into some of these insights, programs like our stewardship recognition programs that exist um, in, in many different states uh, in, the, in the U.S. Um, are tapping into things like commitment by asking people to make a public commitment, which is especially important if you're asking for behavior that's sustained over time, like the implementation and maintenance of, of best management practices. Um, also ego by recognizing um, farmers for these actions and then trying to highlight the stewardship and an effort to change social norms. So there's natural alignment with this, um, these kind of behavioral insights to, to how programs are designed, but there hasn't been as much careful testing with, with the finer details of how the programs are implemented. Um, and so we acknowledge this as a gap um, when we, uh, in, in that paper that I mentioned in environmental and resource economics. And this is just one example. There are many cases um, in which, you know, we have this kind of baseline knowledge and now it's, you know, ripe with opportunity to go in and experiment uh, and, and I'll talk in a moment about different kinds of experiments that could be conducted. Um, so we also in the chapter provide a, a kind of a quick summary, right, of the experimental economics research that's been done looking at economic mechanisms uh, in particular. And so we look at three broad categories, including um, reverse auctions and different payment for ecosystem services programs, um, different regulatory um, and market mechanisms to improve water quality. A lot of this work focuses on um, different ambient um, pollution policies that can be used to reduce non-point source pollution, different variations of that. Uh, and then we also look at policies and, and institutions for water withdrawals, which of course has a lot of implication, implications for uh, irrigation management. And so thinking about the, the knowledge that we gain from this body of work, which would certainly be uh, more than an hour seminar on its own, but I wanted to introduce it and give you a flavor in hopes that you'll go um, and, and check out the chapter for, for this overview. All right, so we know that we have all of this knowledge um, that can, we can do more with, right, in, in, in testing this in agro-environmental contexts. As researchers, then, we're thinking about, well, how do we do that, right? What tools do we have, <clears throat> excuse me, at our disposal? Uh, so we spend time in the chapter thinking about the trade-offs that we make as researchers when thinking about what type of experiment is most appropriate for to answer a particular research question. Um, and we break these into four stages. So I'll show you those now. Um, and talk about complementarities. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that when I, you know, we couldn't find the perfect word. Uh, stages might not be it because, because it kind of implies that you have to work through them, you know, one by one. We're not saying that every project has to go through all four stages. It's more of thinking about how we layer the foundation of our overall knowledge and kind of the natural progression of testing, um, you know, testing different interventions and, and learning about how people are going to respond to that. So as I go through, uh, hopefully that becomes, you know, more clear. So we put together uh, this framework, again, type of experiment, the first stage um, being really focused on laboratory experiments. Um, and I'm gonna go through each of these stages individually, but let me just tell you the, how the, we think about the classification. We think about location, right? Is this a lab or a mobile lab, or is this in a field setting? The source of values, are we um, inducing values, right? Or are these endogenous values? that are coming from the participants? Is the framing context neutral or context specific? 
uh, who is who are the participants, right? Are they students or is this from the target population, which of course in this case is farmers or a, a rural landowner population? Are, are they aware that they're participating in research? Um, do the decisions link to real changes that are happening on their land? And then what are the incentives? Are they, are they doing things uh, for experimental dollars that will be converted into cash or are these decisions in actual currency um, which often involves um, some, uh, some large financial implications when we're talking about actual currency and agriculture. So we talk about these types and, and how they're complementary, but trade-offs exist. So I'm gonna step through each of them. And as I go through, I'm gonna highlight some, some fat, um, elements, right? Characteristics of the different experiment stage and how it relates to uh, trade-offs between internal and external validity, right? Uh, internal validity being able to um, argue that these uh, observed correlations between the treatments and outcomes are causal, right? And then external validity being our ability to extend that causal relationship that's identified to other uh, contexts, right? Other settings, other types of um, participants or, or individuals. Okay. Uh, and then what we'll do is I'm going to show you how um, we utilized this uh, three-dimensional graph that's, you know, that was developed in another paper to then place the different stages uh, in the graph so you can see the trade-offs among control, context, and representativeness. Um, so control um, being that, you know, you don't have these other external uh, factors that are you can't measure them necessarily, but they're influencing behavior, right? If you have high control, then you're eliminating those external factors. And that relates to internal validity, right? You need that control to have the internal validity and being able to identify that causal effect. Um, the other, another axis being the context, right? So, um, you know, does the experiment provide the information about how these decisions relate to real world settings that a farmer may be making a decision in. Okay? This relates to a concept of parallelism, right, which uh, is important often when you're talking to program staff or policymakers because they want to know how the decisions and the outcomes that we observe in our research through our experiments relate to those real settings and would be observed in real settings with farmers. And then the last dimension is representativeness. Um, so do these uh, participants represent the real decision makers? And which trade-offs are worth making? Uh, we're economists, uh, we're used to the answer. It depends, right? It depends on a lot of things, but uh, the big two I would say are, you know, what is the goal of your research and how does it build on the existing knowledge, right? And that will help determine which trade-offs you're willing to, to make based on thinking about that individual and unique contribution of the particular study uh, that you're working on. So just stepping through these um, kind of rather quickly, uh, that first stage, again, this is mainly focused on laboratory experiments. We break them up um, in, into A and B to indicate whether there's context, right, in, in the laboratory experiments. Um, I included one of my, you know, kind of top quotes that I, you know, really like about lab experiments, but that they're able to provide a test bed. Okay. And I think that the real value of these are providing ways to, or, or providing a tool to test hypotheses derived from theory, right? General hypotheses about behavior in different settings. And the lab provides a great place to do that because you have the most control right, as demonstrated in the graphic here. Um, you don't have representativeness because you're working with students, but if you're asking basic questions about behavior, right, that's okay. That's a trade-off that's worth making. Okay. Um, in terms of context, uh, I'm sure we could get in kind of a debate about this with the people that are on the call. I'll tell you my, my personal opinion, which has changed drastically over the last, um, seven years, but I am really leaning towards in lab experiments, um, valuing the context-free experiments that really uh, kind of dig into basic fundamental questions about behavior. Um, I 
when we start introducing context, I get a little concerned about in, about my uh, losing a little bit of control, right? I don't think the trade-off is huge there, but that's how you know I'm uh, the value that I'm really putting in lab experiments currently. Uh, not I, I'll admit though that sometimes I still introduce context where I feel it's appropriate and and helps the research. But I thought I would share my uh, current take on that trade-off. So stage two, we're talking about artifactual and framed field experiments. This is when we go out and we're engaged working with the actual decision makers. This is expensive though. This is There's a lot of effort and we're gonna talk about this later in recruiting farmers, right? You pay them a lot more than students. You're often moving, you know, going to them to recruit them. So if you're working to all, you know, that much to get this target population, you're often interested in how they make decisions in specific contexts. So you can run artifactual field experiments, of course, where you run the exact same kind of context-free experiment that you ran with students. Um, but again, my personal opinion on this is that I'm leaning more towards when I get to this point to bring in that context and engage after the um, experiment, engage in conversations with the farmers about that decision-making process. Uh, and so I think that these um, types of experiments are very valuable uh, to get, have enriched information, right, about um, the, the different uh, decision-making environments we put our participants in. Okay, moving to stage three. Uh, here we're talking about field experiments with potential on-farm on implications, right? So cases in which farmers would be making decisions that could actually influence the management of their land, right? More money is typically on the line when, when this is the case, right? So we're using real uh, dollars now, not just experimental money. Um, but, but the value, right, and the benefit is in addition to having that still that great representativeness from our target population, we're introducing more context, right? The trade-off being that all, you know, losing some control uh, because you're not able to account for all of these factors external to the experiment that may influence the decisions. But these are very attractive to stakeholders because uh, of the parallelism, right? And that these decisions really reflect what farmers uh, are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And then finally, stage four being randomized controlled trials. Often you are working on these with, uh, in collaboration with like a government agency or some other partner group, actually testing these treatments in the field. So this is you know, the, the gold standard for context and representativeness, um, but the, the lowest amount of control over any of these experiments. Though at this point, you, you know, I, I would imagine that you're testing something that we have a foundational amount of knowledge for from these other types of uh, experimental tools and non-experimental tools that it's important now to go and test it in the, in the real world setting. Okay, so let's say you decide, you know, for your particular research question and the goal of your work, which type of experiment is most appropriate, right? Next, you have to confront a number of challenges that, are, that we're facing. Uh, just as economists, and then also as experimental economists, and then ones working with, uh, with farmers, right? So this allows us to um, create a credible evidence base by being aware of these issues and then using best practices that have been put forth, um, and also add, adding to those best practices as well. All right, I'm gonna quickly go through five of these challenges. Um, including replicability, underpowered studies, publication bias, participation recruitment, and detecting heterogeneous treatment effects. Uh, I'll note that really these last two are the ones that are um, can be quite unique to the ag environmental context. The first three are of course important, uh, but you know also apply generally to a lot of other types of studies. So the first one, um, replicability crisis. As experimentalists, um, replicability is, you know, kind of what we consider a, a fundamental uh, benefit of using experiments. It, you, 
you say you're gonna do an experiment, we're gonna put all of the uh, materials out there about how it was conducted and replica replication it should be expected, right? In other fields, it's a natural part of the research process. Um, interestingly, we here, it rarely happens, right? It's hard to get it funded. It's hard to get papers published that are replication papers, especially in top journals. We see this tide turning a little bit and people being more open to it, but it, it's still a challenge. Um, I, I like this figure on the left-hand side. Um, this is from a 2017 paper showing the publications on the on the top panel of the in the top 150 econ journals. So publications over that those 40 years growing exponentially. Um, on the bottom panel, looking at the use of experiments also growing exponentially. But um, mention of replication and the replication rate being extremely low. Okay, so. What can we do uh, about the replication crisis? Well, we put forth a couple of best practices. And uh, as, you'll, as you'll notice, as I go through the slides, these best practices here also help address some other challenges that are gonna come up, um, but I'll mention them here for replicability. The first is to publish pre-analysis plans. Um, these are plans that are put forth you know, before you conduct research that describe the hypotheses, the experimental design, uh, power calculations, um, you know, who you're gonna sample, how you're gonna do it, how you're gonna analyze your data. Basically, it's providing this plan that provides opportunity for um, the researcher to be transparent, right, about what they're gonna do. And it provides benefits of making sure that the research is well planned out, right? Time has been taken in those early stages. Uh, and we're gonna talk about this again when we mention um, challenges with power. Okay. Uh, another pr best practice is to design and pre present the studies with replication in mind. Um, so this involves sharing uh, documentation, right? Instructions for the experiment, uh, code and data, right? The data that were generated by the experiment and the code that was used to analyze the experiment more journals are requiring this type of information to be published in supplementary um, appendices, right, in supplementary material. So we really encourage researchers, uh, even if it's not requested of them, to do that, right, and to, that provides an advantage for others who may then come in and want to replicate the study um, and learn if those findings are robust in other contexts. Um, which can be useful in growing this uh, knowledge base. Okay, the second issue, uh, underpowered studies. So uh, power, um, most simplistic uh, prob probably uh, definition of this is um, our ability to detect an effect when it exists, right? Or other words, uh, the probability of detect uh, rejecting that null hypothesis if it's true. Okay, and the problem is that in underpowered designs, the, the sample distribution of that, that estimated effect is gonna be more variable. So you're more likely to have a result that uh, is exaggerated, right? right? It's too big or it's the wrong sign. Um, so if all of these effects were published, we, we might not be as concerned because you could look at them holistically, but as we'll talk about in a moment, when we think about publication bias, it's more likely to have large, kind of flashy, uh, exciting effects to be published. So this is a problem, right? It's a problem for the credibility of our research. Um, and so we advocate for conducting power analyses, publishing those with the pre-analysis plan, um, additionally, reporting standardized effect sizes um, it, it can, is very helpful also for other researchers who are trying to understand, well, what effect size, you know, might I expect right, with this type of intervention? Uh, so that's very useful. Um, and then also um, correcting for multiple hypothesis testing. So here, this is kind of, this is linked to power because the, the more hypothesis you test, right, the more likely you are to find something that's significant, even if it's not really significant. Um, and so you may need to streamline your research if you're not able to have 
sufficient power for a study, streamlining that research, reducing the number of hypotheses that you're testing, reducing those treatments, right? Those are usually things that are linked um, in order to design a study that, you know, may not seem as grand, right? You may not be able to answer 12 questions, but if you can answer one question or two research questions with uh, really credible evidence, that's better, right? So uh, we, uh, in a minute, I'll talk more about how we have to recalibrate how our expectations, right, for studies um, that are published. Okay. Uh, I will also note that um, I put this figure in on the left-hand side. So this is from a, a recent study in the Review of Environmental Economics and Policy. Uh, the finding being that median power for studies in environmental and resource economics um, were about 33%. You know, our, our target here is, is typically 80, uh, 80%. So uh, this is certainly a challenge in, in our field as well not just generally um, in, you know, in the top uh, econ journals. It's a challenge everywhere. Okay, uh, as I said, these challenges are linked, uh, the next one being publication bias. So uh, it, this occurs when those, it's more likely to publish statistically significant results. Um, so I feel like I've said, uh, Kind of enough about this one, I, and I want to make sure we have time for, for everything and keep an eye on time here. Uh, but the issue being that there could be, this could be the result of people doing things that are unethical, right? Uh, instead of, you know, p-hacking, taking, using practices to try to find that significant result. Um, but it could also be related to the other issues that we mentioned about studies that are just uh, trying to do too much, um, or just, you know, not very well designed and having exaggerated effects. And then if those studies get published, it's skewing our understanding uh, of results about decision-making. So this challenge, we pr uh, propose two best practices. One, doing more replications. Um, and the next, publishing null results, right? Being willing to put in that time and, and to do that as researchers not just being discouraged by our null results, but understanding that we learn a lot from those null results and others will learn from that as well. And so not just putting it in the file drawer, but publishing that and being open to that as reviewers and editors. Um, so these two are, are quite important. Participation recruitment, um, best practices. Well, first I'll just say very challenging to um, recruit farmers. You know, there's a small group of them. Some of them can be very tired of being contacted. We often see response rates in the one to two percent range. It can be very discouraging. Um, best practices here: providing adequate payments. Right. This also helps us to avoid bias that's involved with just self-selection or convenience bias, where people that are interested in the research participate. So, trying to get more of a representative sample um, can be um, assisted by providing more money. Also means we have to write more money into our grants, but you might pay 15 or $20 an hour for students and have to pay $100 an hour or more for farmers. Um, another uh, best practice is going to farmers, right? Uh, finding locations that are convenient for them to come uh, if you're doing some sort of artifactual or framed field experiment, um, going to expos, Right, this is a photo of one of my colleagues, Kelly Davidson, um, who did a field experiment with farmers and went to expos in order to make it easier for them um, to participate and try to recruit representative uh, samples by going to places um, where a lot of different types of farmers um, were engaged. Right? Also working with trusted members of the community uh, is really important. Okay. And the last issue being heterogeneous treatment effects. Um, so farmers are, are different. They're very unique. Um, they, they manage their land in different ways, depending upon factors that are important to them. Some are more profit driven. Others are, um, you know, really driven by preserving a family legacy, uh, being a, a good steward. So 
we need to learn more about which types of interventions influence which type of farmers. This could also be important for a program that's targeting a specific subpopulation like uh, beginning farmers or women landowners. Uh, so a couple of best practices here. The first one being using stratified and blocked randomized designs so that you have adequate representation in these strata to have adequate power for your uh, hypothesis tests, okay? And then the next one being standardizing the collection and reporting of key information about farmer characteristics. And I copied here a table um, out of a paper in Applied Economic Perspectives and Policy um, by Rosh et al, where they suggest which types of characteristics um, to collect based on what we know about the importance of those characteristics and how they impact responses to treatments in agro-environmental uh, settings. All right, the next uh, portion of the chapter, again, this is probably my favorite part, and I wish that we had had more time and space to explore these issues because they're really important, but is about research ethics and partnerships with ag communities. I found this quote from Linda Prokopi, which I just loved. Uh, As researchers, we need to be constantly aware that the issues we study deal either directly or indirectly with people's livelihoods and well-being. We cannot take this responsibility lightly. This is very true for us uh, as experimentalists, um, working with farmers in any setting, right, but particularly in field settings in which we're asking them to make real decisions about their farm, okay? So these are issues that we discuss that go beyond standard IRB issues about how we work with human subjects, but really focus in uh, on what types of questions we're asking of farmers and how we're engaging with them. Okay. So considerations, um, I would argue that, you know, we as researchers are more transient and disinvested than our participants. I, I don't mean that negatively. Of course, we're very invested in our research, um, but it's not our, you know, money on the line. So we have to be able to look at it from that perspective and understand, um, you know, the the importance of what we're in the magnitude of what uh, farmers uh, would be doing right in the experiment. Important part of this is working with uh, leaders in the community with cooperative extension connections right if you're here in the US those can be excellent. Uh, I've gained a lot from my colleagues in extension of having reality checks right for for my ideas of what I'm hoping to roll out with farmers. Uh, and then also using them as trusted resources that farmers know um, and you know, trust when they are being invited to participate in a study, uh, particularly the case when I'm doing something like a framed field experiment, when I'm inviting, um, trying to get a representative group uh, to come into a, a lab type setting. Okay. Uh, also thinking about the next project and other researchers, maybe that other researcher in that next project is you, but maybe not. You want to maintain uh, relationships, demonstrate that you have respect for the unique knowledge that these farmers are bringing to the table, um, and ensure that they walk away with positive feelings, right, about the experience, uh, so that they're willing to continue to engage uh, with researchers down the road. This is, of course, very linked to the idea of collaborating. Um, collaborating with government agencies and other partner organizations. For all of the reasons I just mentioned, these can be a great benefit to us as researchers, um, particularly when we're doing some, something like a randomized control trial. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to imagine a case where we wouldn't be working with a partner because we're embedding uh, an intervention into a program, right? But obviously um, there are challenges with doing this as well. These challenges can be particularly relevant for earlier career researchers um, because it, it can take a long time, right? And, you know, it takes a level of persistence, uh, a lot of conversations, a lot of relationship building um, to uh, talk about all sorts of things, uh, including timelines, aligning expectations of the work, 
uh, and making sure people are coming together with kind of a vested interest in understanding the true outcome of the experiment, right? Not just wanting it to work and have great results, but also being um, valuing a null result in those cases as well and learning from those, okay? So we have to be prepared uh, often for long timelines. Uh, when I was putting this slide together, I also thought about the, the serenity prayer, right? Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, um, the courage to change uh, the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We probably need that a little bit when we're, when we're thinking about this type of work um, and being in it for kind of the, the long haul and not just trying to jump in and, and do a quick project and then move on. So summary of key recommendations, uh, I'm not going to belabor these because I've mentioned them a lot. So I've mentioned um, uh, spending time planning new studies, registering them. We talked about that. Here are some options, right? Open science framework as predicted, going to the AEA RCT registry, and then the other um, best practices I've already mentioned. Uh, being conservative when we're designing, right? We talked about this, uh, streamlining, simplifying, acknowledging effect sizes are likely smaller than, we're th than we think they're going to be. This means we need more participants to be adequately powered, right? Some nudges might have standardized effect size of 0.1. Um, it can still be economically meaningful and we'll still wanna test it, but then we'll need a lot of people in order to detect it, okay? Uh, being thoughtful with recruitment, right? I've mentioned um, all of these, I think. One I didn't mention was avoiding deception. Um, there's a lot of uh, great literature out there, including a paper by Tim Kaysen and uh, ERE in 2019 that I'll direct you to, which I think is really valuable in thinking about um, those kinds of issues. And then responsibly reporting results. And I've, I've mentioned these, right? Avoiding um, the, the searching for significance. All right, keeping an eye on time and I wanna make sure I have time for questions. So I'm gonna um, just mention that we also had some recommendations for editors and reviewers, funding agencies and partner organizations, basically coming down to placing emphasis on the research quality, encouraging replications, not just uh, applauding statistically significant results, um, but also valuing null findings. For the funding agencies, being realistic, right? Not expecting researchers to come in and try to do it all uh, and requiring pre-analysis plans with power analyses. And then for partner organizations, being open to these collaborations, um, valuing what we learn uh, from carefully testing new interventions, right? Organizations are testing things all the time, uh, but it's important to know if the things that are being tested actually work or not and experiments provide that tool. Um, to, to um, measure those effects by comparing them to our control. All right, uh, I'm gonna jump here to uh, the last framework and this will be where I'm, I'm wrapping up. Uh, we end with a framework for assessing the benefits and costs of projects. Um, and we think this is probably particularly will resonate with early career uh, researchers, like I said. You know, there can be a lot of um, of opportunity cost and effort with some projects. So you have to, of course, assess whether the reward and value is there. Uh, actually, I actually shouldn't have skipped my last slide. I'm gonna go back to it because it's worth the minute it's gonna take to go through it. Uh, there's some advice that we provide in terms of prioritization um, and thinking about, well, what, what projects do I take on, right? You can consider the, the costs, the monetary cost, the time cost to design a well-designed, right, sufficiently powered study, uh, the expected social net benefit, and how, how important this, is this going to be if, um, you know, with the result that you find, right? If this works, could it provide, you know, a lot of benefit in terms of um, reduce, uh, reducing pollution, right, or whatever uh, environmental target you're working on? The degree of uncertainty regarding the expected net, net benefit in other words, if you're already convinced that this is gonna make a big impact, well, it might not be worth continuing to test it, right? Because the research already shows us that this is impactful, right? So maybe it's time to go test it in the field, not do another framed field experiment or lab experiment. And then the, the benefit to researchers, that's really where this 
this diagram comes in in this figure because we all have to, of course, assess this for ourselves. All right, well, you've already seen my takeaways and I've told you about them. I had to find a way to put in Purdue University's little um, Ag Valentine's Day uh, cards. So if you're looking to send someone an Ag Valentine, uh, go to their, their website. I thought they were super cute uh, and a self, you know, uh, self, uh, selfless attempts. I don't know what word I'm looking for there uh, to, to put in a plug for the book chapter. Uh, you know, it, it was really a great experience putting it together. I learned so much from, from all of you who have done work in this field. Uh, and so I encourage you to, to check that out. And with that, I will wrap up. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, that was so great. Thank you so much. Uh, I know I really enjoyed it. So we have a we have a few a few different questions I've I've gathered and of course if anybody has any further questions just continue to submit them via the chat. Uh, so one question is uh, asking sort of about the the role of evidence evidence based policy sort of and how policymakers uh, resonate with this. So you describe the advantages of experimental design, but the the question is, do you have any? evidence or anecdotes about uh, if these advantages really resonate with uh, program practitioners in the government or in nonprofit, um, or any anecdotes about how uh, these practitioners have not uh, incorporated insight experimental or evidence in their, in their uh, design or implementation. Oh, is Paul setting me up for this question? We were just talking about this. <laughs> um, so, it is a really great question. Um, my so there's certainly examples, right? And and the CBER team has done a lot of work uh, working with uh, individuals in the USDA and, and USDA programs to to try different things. So that that's an example that you could look towards. Mine are more. I guess my comments that are, are coming to the top of my mind right now are more anecdotal based on recent workshops that I've been involved in, I do think that there is a, a challenge in, a, in with a couple things. One, convincing people that it's worth the, the time and investment on their part to engage with mm -hmm. researchers and think carefully about how the program would need to be rolled out and um, what measurement would need, um, would involve uh, of those outcomes. So that is a challenge. The other is just kind of helping them see the, the benefit to them, right? And in terms of, well, if you find a result that this intervention works, or if there's no result, how will that impact what you are doing and um, achieving as a program? So I think uh, hitting upon those points in the early conversations is really important to illustrate the value. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Uh, so the next, the next question is about about your four stages and just a question of if uh, each of those four in your mind, each of those four stages is equally important or if uh, perhaps mm. there are substitutes or you could skip some of them. Uh, what are your thoughts there? So I'll reiterate, I, I'm certainly not saying that for each project, an individual researcher needs to step through each of the stages, right? That would be unrealistic. <laughs> I do think, though, that in terms of if you can skip some of them, well, if you already see examples uh, in the literature of laboratory experiments saying that, um, you know, providing information, I'm going to pick one of the studies I've been involved in, providing information about individuals like you, right, in mm -hmm. terms of adoption of practices, it influences people and makes them more willing to adopt if others are adopting. Like, if you see that kind of evidence in a lab experiment, a frame field experiment, then I think it would be valid to then go and test that either in a field experiment or an RCT. So in that way, skipping steps makes sense, yeah. right? Yeah, that's a good, good answer. Yeah, thanks. So uh, another sort of group of questions about trying to publish uh, replications or negative results. So uh, there's, there's some evidence that uh, published papers in leading psychology and economics journals that fail to replicate uh, are failed to be replicated, are, are cited more than those that can be replicated. So why would anyone, particularly junior scholars, want to do all these practices that lead to less exaggerated but more likely to be replicated results? <laughs> and then the related um, question is, since journals seem to want to be publishing uh, novel first-time results, is there some role for special issues on replicated experiments or negative 
results to help overcome uh, this disincentive for junior scholars. <laughs> right. <Okay>. Or everyone. <laughs> Good question. So on the first one, I guess I would say that's a that's really um, prioritizing our private benefits as researchers who want to be cited a lot, if I'm understanding the question correctly. <laughs> and so I think the value, of course, then is that I, I, I think that most of us are motivated by actually wanting to know what's true, like the, mm -hmm. the, true, the true outcome and the finding. And I collectively thinking about all of the recommendations that others are putting forth, and I'll take this moment to emphasize the recommendations we have in this chapter are from our research community, not just from Kent and me, right? But taking these collectively, I hope we're moving to a place that we can align also the private value to us wanting more citations with mm -hmm. the value of knowing the truth, right? Those, those things should align. Uh, and so getting editors and, and uh, reviewers to, to value that is important. And I think the idea of a special issue is a way to do that kind of thing because it's a proactive effort that editors can take, right? And, and making sure that these kind of studies are emphasized. Uh, and special issues usually get a lot of, um, you know, a lot of interest, right? And press, just like this new one in food policy. Yeah, excellent. So in the last two minutes, uh, we had some conversation in the chat about the role of online samples fitting into some of your challenges and opportunities in terms of uh, recruitment and uh, representativeness. And so uh, curious if you could uh, just comment on that and if online experiments provide a broader platform or more issues than say doing in-person expos. Um, it's a great question. And I'm guessing when talking about online samples, we're talking about like MTurk and, and things like or that. Or like Qualtrics panels. Qualtrics uh, panels, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I do think that those can be very valuable and there's, you know, especially for if you are wanting to recruit um, kind of a, a general broad audience uh, with, to do a laboratory type experiment, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that those are very challenging with, if we're thinking about engaging farmers, right? Mm -hmm. I have, I know of a couple of colleagues right now and trying to engage target groups and, you know, thinking about running sessions with, eight people at a time uh, and, and really trying to focus on doing it online is very um, potentially more costly than, than going to, to farmers, uh, you know, in a, in a location yeah. that's convenient to them. Yeah. So I think there is a role. Okay. Excellent. Probably more for a general population for a laboratory type experiment. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Leah. And uh, I see we're right at time. So we have your questions. We're gonna save the chat. I'll forward those on to Leah if there's any we didn't touch on. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Leah, thank you for this amazing presentation. And I hope to see you all on March 7th for our co-hosted Recap Seabear Seminar. Uh, so looking, looking forward to, to seeing you all in March. Thanks, everyone.